Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. So I'm Dr. Shadi Arafi, board certified small animal surgeon, and we're going to talk about pyometra. I'm glad to see so many people here, uh, considering how common and fairly simple these are to repair, but a lot of information hopefully you can glean from this you can bring back to your practice, um, or maybe this will convince you to start cutting these cases. Um, your proceedings that you have for this talk are very, very detailed. They go into a, a lot of information, a lot of academic stuff. You can read that at your, at your own uh, time. I hope this is going to be more of a practical, clinical approach to this. And any questions you have, feel free to shout them out at any time during the talk. But uh, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll find this uh, useful for your, for your practice. And, and right off the bat, you can, you know, th this, is, this is one of the, the highlights of this talk and basically if you think of this condition, uh, pyometra is a term that we use for it, but cystic endometrial hyperplasia pyometra complex is the more appropriate way. This is supposed to reflect not just the infected uterus portion of the disease, but also that it is a hormonally driven condition. A little bit about me, I graduated from Cornell University in 2006. I then did a one-year general internship at Angel in Boston. I was then followed by two one-year internships, uh, surgical internships at Long Island Veterinary Specialist, three-year surgery residency at LIVS, and then from there, I moved uh, from New York to Las Vegas. I started, I started working at a specialty hospital there, and after about nine months of that, I left, went to Silicon Valley, where I managed three facilities. I was on call 24-7 for a year between three locations. After that, I was 24-7 on call again for uh, a hospital in, in LA uh, to transition them from overnight care to 24-7 multi-specialty and ER. And then finally, at the end of 2019, I started Vet Triage, which is a, a virtual telehealth platform. This is what we're going to go over here today. We'll talk about the incidence of pyometra, signalman, pathophys, um, all the, the systemic changes that you'll see with, with, these, with these affected animals, clinical signs, physical exam findings, working them up, treatment, uh, surgery, mortality outcome, and some key points. A lot of this will be probably uh, very familiar to, to many of you, but uh, there may be some, some pointers here and there that would be a bit intriguing. As I had mentioned, we're gonna try and, and, and remember in the back of our minds that this is actually a complex because it involves a hormonal uh, imbalance with these dogs, and so we'll go into more detail of that here in a bit. It's very common, the incidence, 19 to 25% are affected with pyometra by 10 years of age. Um, it makes up 19% of all intact female diseases, and you can see it at any age. So it's, 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 it's not preferential for, uh, for specific age group. Signalment, um, usually over four to six years of, old, uh, years of age. This is the, the, the big one here, last estrus eight weeks prior. So a classic um, uh, trend that you see with these dogs is they usually were in heat between four and eight weeks before presenting to you with clinical signs. That's your first hint. Well, your first hint is intact female. Your second hint is heat uh, recently, within the past month or two. And then after that, it's the standard clinical signs of PUPD, and then if it's an open pyometra, vaginal discharge. But because not all pyometras are open, which means they don't have vaginal discharge, these other aspects of history are very important, especially if you're a newer doctor and you're trying to figure this out, if you can, if you can make a connection that this is an intact female and get out of the owner that, that they've noticed the dog had heat within the past month or two, that clues you in that this may be a close pyometra, and you can start investigating, investigating that. It's also more often seen in dogs that have not had a previous history of pregnancy as well. Many proposed causes of this. Obviously, the hormonal part is the most common cause. It's a hormonal disease. However, there are some random studies that look at other factors with this. So, you know, take it for what you will. I'm not really sure it changes much for what you do for a pyometra, but it just gives you more perspective as far as the pathophys. So, dietary changes have been implicated. Genetics have been implicated. That's pretty interesting. The goldens are, are at over three times risk. Um, having an open cervix, like for example, postpartum changes like that, so more likely bacteria will ascend and you get a pyometra that way. Sure, why not? Um, or, or if there's any uh, uh, tissue from, from placental tissue or what have you there that breeds bacteria, that'll happen. You don't really change the area retained tissue. And then, sorry. Oh, okay, I thought I started a question. 
And then uh, hormonal, the hormonal changes are of course the main, the main aspect to this because they are intact females and because of the uh, hormonal imbalance, it makes their, for all the reasons mentioned in your proceedings, it makes the, bo the, the, the uh, body more prone to bacterial infection, it affects the leukocytes, those hormonal changes are powerful. It also, it also decides whether or not the cervix is open or closed, what the uterine lining is doing, all that is affected by the hormones. And so if their hormonal ratios are off, you're going to be at risk of developing this disease. And because it's based on hormones and fluctuations, there's, there's types of this disease. And we usually don't classify pyometra as like this. You know, if you're referring a pyometra over to a surgeon or an ER hospital, or you're gonna cut the pile yourself, we don't usually use this type of language. You never call and say, hey, I have a 3A coming your way. You know, like no one's doing that. But we like to keep things as objective as possible. And, and these types are published in the literature and it also describes the progression um, with some overlap, as usually these things are, but the progression of the disease. So it starts off with the cystic endometrial hyperplasia, which is the, the bubbling up, uh, essentially, cyst formation because of the hormonal imbalances in the, uh, the lining. That's type one. Type two, um, a pro progesterone cervical relaxation. So now, this, now the cervix is relaxed, it's open, giving way to bacteria ascension, Type three, you now have plasma cells that infiltrate the, the uterine lining. These are plasma cells, I've been told. <laughs> and <laughs> that's when clinical signs begin. So PUPD, vaginal discharge. Of course, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, non-specific stuff as well. But usually the classic is PUPD, vaginal discharge. And then finally, type four, either open or closed, but you've got chronic endometritis. And obviously, most of us are seeing type threes, type Type 3A, or any type number with A, means it's an open pio, which has, a, a thankfully, a larger incidence of, of occurring versus closed pyometras. So this is how you characterize this disease more objectively, and it also shows the, uh, the wide variation or stages of the, of the, of the disease. Systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So this applies to any condition, not just pyometras, but it's always nice to remind you that we do have criteria like this, where if, if for cats and dogs, their, their uh, TPR and white count is in one of these uh, abnormal brackets, then they're potentially dealing with SIRS. And this doesn't tell you anything more other than there's a systemic component to whatever disease this pet has. We must not forget that diseases like pyometra can affect multiple organs, either directly from bacterial infection or indirectly from bacteremia and uh, hemodynamic imbalances, dehydration, all that stuff. So it, it helps you determine that this, this dog or cat is being affected by this disease, whatever that disease is, uh, pretty, pretty dramatically or at least uh, systemically. And so these are parameters that you would use to decipher that. Does it change what you do? Maybe not, but at least you can, again, objectively categorize and say, I'm worried this patient has SIRS. It's gonna be secondary to something else, but these are the parameters that you would use for dogs and cats and people if you are looking at, at SIRS. So pyometra cases also, um, we always think of it as like just, oh, it's a uterine problem, you know, we're done, and it is a uterine problem, but there are systemic sequela to it. So, a lot of the pathophys, the systemic sequela to pyometra, has to do with the bacteria infection, most commonly E. coli. E. coli is 100% involved with every single culture of these dogs. And if there's, if there's more than one bacteria in the culture, E. coli is always part of that group. It's always there, always there. So E. coli is, 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 is a, a main point. You know, it's got virulence and pathogenic factors that, go, that are in the proceedings that, that affect the entire body. Um, which we'll go over here in the next couple slides, but this is the main reason, and this is also the reason why you end up seeing PUPD because of the effects that this bacteria has on the nephrons of the, of the kidney. This is your classic pyometra in, in, in surgery. So um, there, this is just, sort of, just to remind, there are other bacteria that could be involved with this, but E. coli is always involved. So these are just, not to get too, too uh, uh, molecular here, but these are just some of the factors that are implicated when you talk about systemic effects of this disease in animals. This is what E. coli and other bacteria have as features that causes, that causes problems with them. So just to just make you aware of it, still may not change what you do clinically, but it is why these animals get so sick.
And then this slide is just to remind us that there are systemic effects to the body, the liver is affected, the kidneys are affected, you have um, uh, antibody, immune complex deposition in the organs, and so it's a systemic disease, that's, that's the point. Now, again, if you get rid of the nidus of the infection, which is the uterus, then of course you hope that these secondary changes in the body are going to clear up, right, with supportive care and time. But um, the reason, the big reason why I mention this is because when I take in a pyometra, assuming the funds are there for the client, this gets expensive, but I do monitor for renal disease after the pyometra is done. So I typically will relab them um, within 24 to 48 hours post-op to make sure their kidneys are okay. So I have, I have on IV fluid diuresis post-op, plus have the kidneys get rid of these toxins. As the patient is getting better, because they almost always do, right? They look great once you remove the uterus. Um, well, usually, almost always. Um, uh, I still have them on IV fluids to diurese them, and as long as the finances are there for the pet owner, I will relab them a day or two later to make sure that we're not dealing with any azotemia before I let them go home. Renal, renal disease, renal failure is a, it is a, a published a complication of this disease because of the, the toxins from the, from the bacteria. And so um, it, it causes these problems, and if one preventive way of one way of preventing this would be to have them in the hospital a little bit longer on IV fluids and then relab them to see. Now, if, what if the owner can't afford that? Then just don't do that. The main goal is get the uterus out, right? And then get them home on pain meds, antibiotics, and then they'll, they'll, do, they'll do well, usually they'll do well. But um, uh, if you have the gold standard way of doing it, you want to at least talk to them about renal disease with this, with the pyometra, and then ideally have them on some level of diuresis uh, post-op. Yes? So the question is, can I use NSAIDs if there's azotemia? So I, I would tend to refrain from using them. We do have gabapentin, tramadol, I'm sure there are other drugs that are newer that I'm not as familiar with that you can give orally at home and instead of NSAIDs. NSAIDs are great analgesia, by the way. So we often, we often don't give NSAIDs enough credit for being not just anti-inflammatory, but provide analgesia on multiple levels of the body's nervous system. But having said that, I still would, I wouldn't use it. I, I would go with it. Yeah. And then if you had a dog that's had a pyometra and sick for a week, that's, that's rough, right, right. And I guess along those same lines too, this, again, this is fairly basic for probably most of you, if not all of you, but um, azotemia, pre-renal, renal, and post-renal causes of azotemia, and the big differentiating factor is urine-specific gravity. So too often we kind of just assume it's one of those three categories or a combination of categories if we don't check urine-specific gravity. So just just keep that in mind uh, as well. When you see the team, you have to think pre-renal, renal, post. How do I differentiate? I need a uh, urine-specific gravity, and that'll, that'll help guide you. There are other diagnostics too. If you have the blocked cat, right? You also know it's a blocked cat. So, so uh, you know, keep it clinical, but just as a reminder. But yeah, I stay away from NSAIDs and if, if they have azotemia. Now the question might be though, if the azotemia resolves, do you, can you start NSAIDs later? And I don't know. Um, I get a bit spoiled as a specialist because normally I have internists. And so if I'm seeing this two week post op re recheck for a PIO, and let's say it's got arthritis or something, and I want to put him back on NSAIDs, I'm going to ask the internist down the hall, can I, can I do it? But I don't, I don't know the answer uh, to it on a more global scale. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'd be comfortable with it, but I'm sure people do it. And I'm sure they do it. It's fine. But I'm not sure. Clinical signs, uh, can, they don't have to be very specific. Obviously, you're looking for an intact female with the history I mentioned, uh, with vaginal discharge, that's the ideal. You have all these you know, reproductive type changes, disgusting discharge from the, from the back end. That's your classic uh, signalman, there's nothing new there. Imaging is phenomenal. So like, you know, as, this is where it helps you. I went to my internship and getting my first PIO, I'm like, I don't know what to do. How, do I even, how am I gonna figure this out, you know? And uh, we usually either don't have ultrasound or the ultrasound they give the interns is shitty. So you just, you have nothing to work with, right? So you're, you're going based on radiographs and you wanna see this, this classic soft tissue fluid filled structure on the floor of the abdominal cavity coming from the, the, the cervix uterine area here. And then on the BD, you wanna see this, you know, almost bilaterally symmetric fluid filled structure. There's not much else that causes that other than a pyometra, especially when you take into account that 
female and has all the history and clinical signs, physical exam findings of pyometra. So this is a great thing to see as a, as a, as a newer graduate. You're like, all right, I got it, you know? If you do have an ultrasound, even a crappy one, um, I used to call it like the, like the double bladder sign, I'd call it that. So if I, if, I, if I put the probe in the area where I normally do a cystocentesis and I see two bladders, then I'm like, okay, one's gotta be uterus, you know? And so then I have my diagnosis and I'm done. I don't need to like follow the uterus up to the ovaries, I don't have that skill set. So I just say, oh, there's two bladders, it's gotta be a pyometra. Plus intact female, all the symptoms, et cetera. So just, you know, just keep in mind, this is a great thing you can show owners, even though you're a clinician, you're super experienced, you know it's a pyometra, um, and you could cut without imaging if you wanted to, but ideally, gold standard, you'd image the dog to confirm, show the pet owners, look, this is all pus, we need to get this out of, the, out of her to make her feel better. Now, whether, whether you're going to add, by the way, three view thoracic radiographs for metastatic screening depends on the patient, obviously, right, and the owner finances, but it'd be nice to screen these dogs for cancer, not that cancer's related to pyometra, but just because you have an older dog, maybe it's worthwhile screening them, just FYI. It's not mandatory, per se, but um, it should be part of a, of, a, of a workup, especially a dog who's middle-aged to older. And so there's your, you know, your, your, your double bladder sign um, that tells you, oh yeah, this, this has to be uterus, nothing else like that, and then just, you know, just left kidney, just to remind us of the kidney disease with this, but, um, and there's a pyometra next to the kidney hanging out. So ultrasound, of course, you know, I think a lot of us will cut these dogs with, barely with x-rays, let alone ultrasound is typically not needed, but, you know, if you do have it, it will definitely give you a much more thorough answer than radiographs. Besides, the pyometras aren't that big, right? Signs the, the, the fluid-filled um, uh, reproductive organs are mildly fluid-filled, you know, and you, can, you can't really see them on radiographs, so an ultrasound is really good for that. Now, your proceedings goes into heavy detail regarding medical management. When I first wrote this talk years ago, I was surprised by how much literature is out there on medical management for pyometras. So I will emphasize that this is still a surgical disease, ideally treated with surgery, plain and simple. Um, we'll talk about indications for medical management, but as a surgeon um, and a clinician, I, I, it's a surgical disease. And so the treatment is spay the dog, that's the, that's the treatment. But I want you to be aware of, because there may be cases that you have uh, interacted with where the client doesn't let you, or the case is such that you're like, okay, what, how can I treat this dog and not spare? And, and so there is an indication for it, and because it's out there, I want to make sure that you're aware that, that it, is, it is out there. How many folks here have used purely medical management for pyometras? Yeah, yeah, zero, yeah, me, me too. If they don't have any, they come to me on, as a surgeon and they don't have any finances, you know, yeah, I'll try, of course, antibiotics and see what happens, but they know it's grim, so it's, it's not great, but, um, yeah, well, so if you're going to even consider medical management, again, this is a surgical disease, we're doing surgery on these dogs, but if you're going to, the dog presumably is valued for breeding, she's otherwise very healthy, young, she's got an open pile, right, so that pus can just leave the body and the kidney's not affected, you know, that's kind of what you're, what you're hoping for if you're going to pursue anything like this. Um, in some situations, you have a dog that's just a poor anesthetic candidate for surgery, the owner has financial limitations, maybe the owner just doesn't want to, um, or maybe you're using medical management preoperatively to help stabilize the pet in preparation for surgery. These are indications for medical management against the surgical disease, but just so you are aware of that it's, it wouldn't be wrong if, if, if it fall, fall under these categories, but you know, the, the, the concern with these dogs obviously is A, if it's a valued breeding dog, um, you know, there's a chance of reproductive failure after a pyometra is medically managed. There's that possibility. Number two, they can get recurrent pyometras as well. And uh, these conditions are always easier to treat, treat when you treat them earlier on, as opposed to the chronic re recurrent fluctuating pyometra. It's always easier to treat these dogs when they're, when they're acute and you can, you can, well, the best thing is to spay them, obviously, when they're healthy puppies. But if you have to spay them later on in life, do it when they're at the most stable, most healthy. So times where you're not gonna to wanna to consider medical management, besides all the time, is if they have peritonitis, they're febrile, they're hypothermic, closed cervix, they have concurrent ovarian or uterine disease. So those are ones where you're like, hey, here's why we're not gonna do medical management, 
Um, besides the fact that medical management is not ideal, it's also all these factors. These dogs are not going to respond very well to medical treatment, and so we ought to uh, we ought to spay them. Now, as far as concurrent ovarian and uterine disease, so here's like a picture of like uterine cysts or whatever, or rather ovarian cysts. Um, if I have uh, an, a dog who is middle aged to older, even if I don't see a uterine mass or an ovarian mass, I offer the client biopsying the, the uterus and ovaries as a staging tool. That's, that's it, just because you have an older pet, and that's my only logic. I don't, if I see a tumor, different. Obviously, if there's a tumor there, I'm going to recommend um, biopsying. But I will offer them biopsy. The same way I will offer them the uh, option for culturing the uterine pus. You know, because I know there's going to be E. coli in there, and there could be more than one bacteria type in there as well. And what's better than antimicrobial use is more targeted antimicrobial use. I'm going to have my antibiotics perioperatively anyway, and the culture is going to take five days plus to come back. So you, you're going to be treating them anyway with antibiotics. But if I can get that culture in a week later and then decide, okay, do I need to add something or change something, then I'd like that option. Not required. If a pet owner says, look, doc, I can't financially do all this, let alone biopsy and culture, I'm not doing it. That's fine. I don't force them. But I'm going to at least offer the culture to every PIO, and to those that are middle aged to older, I'm going to offer biopsying the, the uterus and the ovaries. I think a lot of labs end up charging that biopsy is like three, what is it, like three segments or something, because two ovaries and uterus, and so it can be, it can be a bit costly. But if the owner is up for it, and it's indicated in that case, indicated in quotation marks, we're doing it just to, just to look, just to see, then have at it. You're taking the organs out anyway, so if you have the opportunity to buy it, see them, if the owners will let you, then, then have at it. Okay, this is just, we're not gonna go into this in any detail, just letting you know that we have stats on this stuff for breeding success and recurrence rate with medically managed dogs. It's all in the notes. Um, I have no experience with this, so I'm just putting it out there to steer aware it exists and, and uh, um, you know, do, do what you will with that information. Complications of medical treatment, if you're gonna go that route. Uterine rupture, inability to breed or whelp, peritonitis, septicemia, failure, or recurrence. So, oh, and by the way, in that other, that other x-ray we had, we got some babies here. So if you have a, a pet that's showing, a dog that's showing signs of, uh, of um, or a cat, but um, I think I've only cut like one cat by um, and, and you also see that there's, there's uh, kiddos in there that plays a role in this, right? So what are the chances that these are viable, viable offspring now? How far along are these, are these puppies? Um, are, we, are we going to sacrifice the mom's health to see if these can come to term and medically manage in the meantime? Or are we going to go ahead and in there and cut and hopefully they're at a point where they're either viable or not, but at least we're going to save the mom. That discussion needs to be had with the, with the pet owner. So uh, you know, that's why this very graph was here. It's all about client communication. So stabilization with surgery, um, we can go into this more detail if you want to. A lot of this is, is your, your typical basic, like treat them for shock type of situation. So you're trying to stabilize them. If they, especially if they have evidence of these, of these conditions, you're using crystalloids, colloids, um, and you're monitoring their, their vitals. Uh, this is pre-op, perioperatively, and post-operatively, pending what you have available to you at your hospital, and pending what the client will let you do. I, like I mentioned before, I want these dogs in the hospital for at least 24 hours, if not two to three days, depending on how sick they are. Some owners are like, no, I'm taking my dog home tonight. Once she's awake, I'm taking her home. I can't afford any of this anymore, you know? Fine, our goal is to save the dog's life. That's the goal. And if we can't do it optimally, at least just whatever we can do to get the uterus out, because they do very well afterwards. So, um, so anyway, stabilization is very important, and you would like to uh, do so before surgery. I even had pyometras where they're like, they're, they're so stable that I'll even have them diuresis before surgery for like six hours, four to six hours, just to get fluids into them and then cut them later on that day. Um, why not? If I have the time and resources to do it, then, then I'll do that. Otherwise, the arm fluids before surgery, during surgery, after surgery, and they're either gonna be on fluids after surgery until they're eating, or ideally until I can relab them to make sure the azotemia is gone. Then I'll stop the fluids. Um, but that's, that's my, my general rule. Your notes go into more detail. Obviously, I'm very familiar with uh, 
with a ventral midline incision for a stay, but there's a bunch of other ways, and obviously depends on you know whether you're talking about prophylactic, so you're just you're staying them, or whether they're 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 diseased and you need the exposure with a pyometra. Um, this is an, this is a, a, a laparoscopic stay, so they're grabbing the the ovary ovarian tissue to I guess transect it. I don't do scopes, but anyway. Great, if your practice can offer scoping for spaying, spaying dogs, phenomenal. Um, obviously for a pyometra, you're probably not going to do it laparoscopically. The tissue is too fi uh, friable, and this is a very large, usually largely distended organ, so you need to have an open approach. But there are various surgical techniques for spaying dogs, diseased or, or not diseased, and then here are all the different pictures of various pyometras, some are very obvious, some not so much, but this is what you get. You want to be very careful with manipulating the tissue. It is friable, the walls are thin. I've had these rupture on me. It adds like 40 minutes to the surgery now. Not only is it bad for the patient, but now you've got to clean up this mess. And so now you're flushing and flushing and flushing, and this, this crap that's in there sticks to everything. Omentum, stomach, intestines, liver, so the abdominal wall. So if you can, obviously, just go extra, extra careful uh, uh, with this, or at least if you're able to, you're going to drape this off really well. So all those abdominal expose, exposure here, have lap, laparotomy sponges around here, really, really cover the that base. That way, if it does rupture, hopefully it's outside the body and you can still handle it easier. How many folks here cut pios? Yeah. Okay. So you can use various uh, surgical modalities to perform your spay, whether it's a regular spay or a pyometra. Um, in all of my talks, I talk about ligature, so something like this, where it's a, it's a, a cautery sealing, bipolar sealing device. You, can, you clamp the jaws on the pedicle, you hit the, the one lever here, and it'll, it'll sizzle, it'll cauterize the tissue, you'll hear it. And then with the, with the button, it'll, you push it and it'll cut. A blade will, will come in between the, the jaws and cut the pedicle for you. So you're cauterizing and then transecting. It can, it can, it can, you can use this up to seven millimeter sized blood vessels. And I've used it for way bigger too. Yes, question? The question is, how far back do you, would you want to go as far as including the cervix or not? And, and, and I, I've heard varying opinions on this. Some people try to chase the cervix, some don't. Um, I'll backtrack a little bit. So stump pyometra, right, a condition where you have a pyometra but in the residual stump, is a hormonal disease. Usually it indicates that there's still residual ovarian tissue. It's not because you left too much cervix in there or uterus in there, it's because there's still hormonal influence, which means you're chasing not just the pyometra stump that has to be now removed, but you also are looking for ovarian tissue. And that could be, that could be really difficult, right? Um, because it's almost always gonna happen in a large breed dog, right? That spay was difficult, large breed dog, deep chest, deep abdomen. Now you're searching in there for ovarian tissue that's gonna be minuscule. Anyway, so just to make that point clear. So I don't have a preference. My, my rule is I'm going to uh, um, include as much tissue as I can. The incision length to me doesn't matter. I've never cared about impressing pet owners with smaller incisions. Now I'm a surgeon, so I can just tell them, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not doing it. And most of the surgeries that I have are complicated, so I need exposure. But as long as I, as long as I don't have to go past the pelvic brim to get access to it, and as long as I don't feel like I'm risking um, uh, uh -oh. may have died or turned off, let's see. Yeah, this is my fourth talk, so this thing's been going all day. Okay, um, so as, long as, I don't, as long as I don't think I'm risking tearing the tissue by retracting it to get to that cervix, I'm gonna go as far down as I can without having to go past the pelvic brim. So some animals, their, their anatomy is such that it's easy to access the cervix, some are not, and I don't really care. I'm trying to remove as much as I can to get the job done. Anybody else have opinions on that? Like, do you guys aim for the cervix, do you not? Is, do people, yeah. yeah, yeah. What I do do, what I do do, <laughs> is um, once I, for a pyometra, it's really a really gross one where like the walls are like, are like really just like filled with this caseous material and it goes all the way down past the pelvic brim. When the, the uterine pedicle of this, I 
A, we'll probably not use ligature for that. I'll probably actually transect it using hemostat or carmalt or something. And then B, I'm probably going to close it in two layers. So I'm going to do like a stomach closure, like a gastrotomy. So I'm going to do a simple continuous and then inver inverting. And then finally, if the omentum reaches there, I will take omentum and actually tack it down with two or three sutures over the, o the omentum, over the, uh, the, the transected uterus, the stump. Yeah, and the idea there is that I still have pus in there. I'm not going to be able to remove it. The body will remove it, but I want to make sure that my incision doesn't form an abscess right there where I transected. So two-layer closure, and then if momentum reaches, you're not detaching the momentum. You're just you're just pulling it along, you know, like a, like a blanket, and then it, and then tack it down with maybe two or three interrupteds um, over the over the incision. Not every pyometra. These are the ones that are like that thick, like disgusting uh, mass. So as far as pedicle surgery goes, you can do whatever you want that works. Obviously, most of us are using you know, needle holders and suture, and fair enough, that's great. Um, as a surgeon, I get to have nice toys, and so I can, I, can, I can have things like this that accelerate the procedure so fast, so fast, it's so good. But there's also um, LDS, there's hemoclips, you can use a variety of things, but ligature for me is the best, but it doesn't matter. Whatever it takes to get the job done, that's what you're gonna do, yes? <laughs> yeah, so the question is, when you use the ligature, do you still stabilize the pedicle after you, after you cauterize and transect to make sure it's okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, usually I'm using um, just like brown ads and thumb forceps and just holding on to it. Um, but also, I, I'll advocate to that point, the use of Balfour retractors. So a lot of us perform spays in GP with no Balfour, no assistant, you're just spaying them. That's why large dog spays are a nightmare because you're trying to do this stay with no retraction and, and you don't have a human in there or a self-retraining retractor to take care of it. So um, I, I, exposure is key with these. So use, use these principles for your large dog space too. Who cares about incision size? Make it big enough so you're not gonna have remnants of ovary, a hemoabdomen from a slip pedicle, either intra-op or post-op. Um, and so you're not struggling and sweating and stuff. So if you don't have the luxury of having like an intern or a resident like I would, you're gonna hopefully have self-retraining Balfour retractors, which you can use for any abdominal exploratory surgery. It keeps that abdomen open. You have so much exposure, it'll make your life so much easier. So just a little plug for retraction, because I, I do have a lot of GPs where I live in Las Vegas, and it's always large dog spades, and I'm like, you can do this yourself. If, you can, if, you can, if you're doing that many spades, Buy the Balfour, it'll pay for itself over time, and you're gonna have so much less stress. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, these complications of surgery are not unique to pyometra. These are spay complications in general. I just went through all the literature and I just gathered all the complications, and these are the, these are the, the main ones. There's many, many more but it's such a commonly performed surgery that we have lots of data on complications from it. This is not to scare you from performing spays, obviously. This is just to let you know that when, a, when you, ha you have a conversation with a pet owner, be like, yeah, this is a routine procedure. There's, like any other surgery, it's got a ton of possible complications. Thankfully, they're very, very low incidence. It's well worth it. We need to do this to save your dog's life. So, you know, do I have your permission to pursue the, the, the spay for the pyometra? But, um, these are all the possible complications of them. Some are more acute, you know, like peritonitis or ureteral trauma. Some are more chronic, ovarian remnant syndrome, ure urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence. So you have to just, um, you know, be aware of them. And whatever conversation you want to have over time for your space spiel to pet owners is, uh, is sufficient. Because pyometra is such a common condition, there's a ton of different mortality factors, some related to biomarkers, um, like C-reactive protein, for example, CRP, there's a whole bunch of stuff in your, in your proceedings about this. But then other uh, hemodynamic and clinical aspects of these dogs affects whether or not they're going to make it. Just like any other disease, it would assume that the sicker they come to you, the worse the prognosis, obviously, right? So, you know, um, high lactate. This is interesting, actually, uh, absence of leukocytosis. So um, I'll get this a lot from like, from like general interns. They'll say, well, I didn't think it was a pyometra because the white blood cell count wasn't elevated or was even low. So I didn't think it was a pyometra. And the problem with that logic is the, blood, the white blood cells are not in the vasculature, they're in the uterus. So it's gonna look like peripherally that the white count is normal or even low. 
Um, it's actually all in the uterus. And so you have to combine the entire clinical picture. So it's just interesting where if you don't have leukocytosis, that worsens the, 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 the prognosis. Well, that might make sense. If, all, if the infection is so bad that all the white blood cells are going to the uterus, yeah, it might be that the absence of leukocytosis is actually a, a, a prognostic indicator. So just keep that in mind when you, when you run these uh, CBCs on these dogs. Don't be confused by the fact that there is not a high white blood cell count. It actually might make sense. If everything else follows the pyometra, intact female, recent heat, PUPD, vaginal discharge, x-rays, ultrasound, whatever, and then you don't have a high white count, who cares? You have all the other evidence to, that, to back it up that it's a pyometra, and this actually makes sense medically. Overall mortality, 0 to 27%. We don't surprise it's so high. I mean, I would have thought it's way less, but you know, it probably speaks to, to, to uh, um, uh, differences in stabilize, stabilizing the patient and how long they're sick for, you know, those factors, but I, I, would, I would have thought it would be, be lower. Euthanasia rate, 10 to, 10 to 12 percent. Uterine, if uterine rupture happens, 50 percent mortality with that. Um, I, I, I've had some pios where there was some extravasation of the fluid and so there was some ascites there and peritonitis, but I can't recall when it ruptured, at least, you know, not iatrogenically, of course, like naturally. Um, the, the, the incidence of having sepsis, if it's a closed pio, is 77%, which is higher than an open pio. That makes sense. If the discharge is not leaving the body, you're more likely to have signs of, of sepsis and bacteremia. All right, so finally, key points. So just remember that this is a hormonal disease. So it's more aptly named cystic endometrial hyperplasia pyometric complex. We're still calling it a pio, but it's just to remind you that there is a, a spectrum of this disease. It's, it is a progression from hormones. Remember, the history, very important. They've had a, a heat a month or two ago, combination with then PUPD. Don't forget that these, do that these dogs, even if they come in super stable, they are still, if you measure their parameters, probably have some level that you can categorize as SERS or sepsis, so treat them as, as such. Even though it is a routine procedure, they do very well. Everybody here has done one you want to remember there is a systemic um, downstream effects to this. Surgery is considered curative, and so that's the best part about this, is if you can at least get the owner to, to, to support uh, uh, both agreeing to and financially affording the pyometra, if you can at least get that, that uterus out, that's the best thing for the dog. Everything else would be great bonuses, like the fluid diuresis and whatever, biopsy and culturing, et cetera, but at least at minimum, surgery is considered curative in these dogs. and. Uh, you know, another question, oh here, this is actually right here, this is it, concurrent mammary gland tumors. So um, I've had dogs that came in from ER, I got called in for do a pio, and they're like, oh yeah, we also signed up for a bilateral mastectomy as well, like the entire chain, a radical mastectomy, bilateral radical mastectomy with a spot, with a pyometra surgery at like three in the morning. I'm like, all right, you know, so it's a bit excessive. Um, it's similar to like GDV surgery and hemoabdomen surgery. If you're gonna have concurrent elective procedures done, it ought to be in conjunction with client communication so you can tell the client, I understand you want these mammary gland tumors removed or these bladder stones removed or whatever, but your dog is not, not stable. We're trying to just get her through pyometra surgery, let alone the cystotomy. So do I have your permission to abandon that plan if all I can do safely is the pyometra? And you let them tell you, yes, doc, use your judgment call, whatever, with it, you know? Now, if the patient is, is stable, and you have concurrent conditions, then yeah, you know, have, have at it. If you think whatever's, whatever's best for the pet, if you think the pet can do it and the client understood the pros and cons beforehand and they bless you with the ability to abandon ship if you wanted to, then feel free. Otherwise, most of the time, again, as a surgeon, I'm coming in just to cut the pyometra and then everything else we have to deal with later on once we get this dog out of this, this crisis. So keep that in mind um, with these. It's not wrong to do it, but it requires client communication. We talked about Balfour retractors, um, prioritization of client finances. This is the point of this is surgery is the main focus. Everything else is, is, is great. Post-op care. So how many folks here with them, when they cut a PIO, send them home the same, the same day, the same night? Yeah, a good, a good number. How many, how many don't? Yeah, so a few. So, um, so as far as post-op care goes, depending on what situation you're in, what, what your hospital 
can provide what the client wants to do and can afford. Um, if they're going to be in the hospital for any length of time, whether it's a few hours or a couple of days, I'm typically going to have them on IV fluids, as I said, until they either are relabbed and confirmed noisetemia and or they're eating. They're going to be on pay meds, pick your choosing. I wouldn't use NSAIDs, but you can, in nar narcotics, uh, injectables, so like hydro, buprenorphine, whatever. Um, and then antibiotics. Usually I'm going with unison injectable, and then when they can start eating, they're going to be on Clavamox, pending a culture if I have access to a culture. And they're going to be on antibiotics for 10 to 14 days after surgery. And, um, and you know, if their culture comes in with a changed antibiotics, we change the antibiotics. Then as far as monitoring parameters go, especially if they came in kind of shocky, you're going to want to me measure blood pressures, QID, if not continuous, but QID ideally, blood pressure monitoring, ECG monitoring, QID, or continuous if ideal. Um, I didn't mention anything about ventricular premature contractions here, but I didn't see that in the literature. But any animal that comes in hemodynamically unstable, you want to see what their, what their heart is doing beyond just auscultation. So an ECG is great, but blood pressure is most important. If I had to pick one, it would be blood pressure. And then the ability to relab them in a day or two to look for azotemia if, um, if the owner wants that. And if they're, or maybe do that on an outpatient. You know, they come in a day or two later from home and, and get the labs done. But anyway, those are all my monitoring parameters for these, for these cases. And then long term, Surgery is curative. If you did submit biopsies, you'll get them back and then decide if there's cancer there or not. You probably usually there isn't. They might find cysts or whatever. But anyway, so that's, that hopefully that helps with post-op care. The big thing with post-op care is the IV antibiotics. Because in a hospital that uses a lot of unison, right, we, we can use it. But most facilities, they may use it once every couple of weeks or something, maybe. And so it becomes a, a waste and too expensive, cost prohibitive. So it just depends on, on how you want to do it at your practice. Okay, um, this is all my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me with, with all the things, and I'll entertain any, any questions you guys have. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. Back to the cervix thing. And yeah. He, um, and I never saw it, but somebody was telling me, um, I think there was a malpractice suit mm -hmm. uh, for a practitioner that, and, and it, it, that they did not remove the cervix. Like, I, I've never removed the cervix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, I don't know if that's true or not, but so the concern is that there's a, a I'd be interested to see, because so my, my issue with that, and again, medical board cases, usually there's, there's a lot of background to it that we may not be privy to, right? You know, maybe, maybe just their medical records sucked and that was it, you know, but, but besides all that, when I, when I did literature search on this, and there was a lot of literature, I never saw any studies looking at removing cervix versus not. Um, now, I, to be fair to you, and to that question, I'd have to look, in, I'd have to look at the surgery books and see what do they comment on in, with a spay. For PIOs. Yeah, for PIOs. For routine spays. Yeah. Well, I didn't look at routine spays, but I looked at PIOs. Yeah. Just yeah. because I was curious, but I don't ever remember that from their conversation with that. Yes. Yeah, so if, if there's so if there's aspects to the surgery that are going beyond what you typically will see or it's posing you a problem as a surgeon, it ought to be in your medical records. You have to put in there, I did this, which may be unconventional because of this. So I made a judgment call as a clinician and I'm allowed to do that. 
So that's the foundation for, for the answer to your question. Um, I've, I've done so many pyometras, and I, I, you know, I've, I've done them in like half a sleep stupor. Cause I, and I, so I don't, I don't have any specific um, recollection of things like that happening with, with me, but I also have ligature, and I have people who can scrub them with me, and I have all the things. So, so I don't know, but, but, but bottom line is, whatever's happening in surgery, document the damn thing. Document it, put it in writing. Time, date stamped, it's in writing. Then you, then you have communications in there that you spoke to the client and told them, made owner aware of intraoperative findings, concern for needs for reoperation if things fail, right? Yeah, and, then, and then, then you're as protected as you possibly could be. You ought to not be judged by making a judgment call as a clinician, but if it's not documented, it didn't happen. That's what I would, I would think. We are horrible with medical record keeping. We're terrible. And I'm sure human physicians are too, but they usually, the ones that I've been to, like they have you know, tr transcribers, right? So they're just writing stuff down for them, which is great. Um, we don't necessarily have that kind of access. So we do it ourselves and we're busy and stressed out, trying to go home on time. And so, yeah, we have crappy medical records. <laughs> and it's a, it's, it's a downfall to a lot of these medical board cases. If you just wrote up the records appropriately, you probably wouldn't have been dinged on it, you know? Yes? Correct. Okay. Yeah, the 50% 50, 50 mortality for uterine rupture is preoperatively. And I'll be honest with you, even that stat is pretty crappy because there is not a lot of literature on, on that stuff. Um, a similar uh, difficult study to reinterpret our septic abdomens from like foreign body perfs. It's just so hard to like compare and contrast these studies because there's so many variables to it. And even less so with uterine because uterine rupture is not very common. So most of the time, if I have a septic abdomen from any cause, I'm telling owners 50-50 shot of making, making it through. Because it doesn't matter what the cause is. Septic peritonitis from pancreatitis, a gallbladder rupture, a foreign body, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, across the board, it's pretty much 50-50 shot of making it. Um, but yeah, so even that number is kind of weak if you want to look at objective data. But yeah, that's pre-op. Yeah, not intra-op. If it ruptures intra-op because we handle it too, dip, too uh, roughly, um, you know, I, I don't see any difference there. I mean, it's only happened to me once that I can remember, but, but uh, and that's all I'll do well. So. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you very much.